And I know this is difficult to see from the back. I'm going to explain it. This is the 2300 year prophecy, the central pillar of Adventism. And what we're going to try to deal with the rest of the day is the first prophecy of the 2300 year prophecy, which is the 49 years that it took to finish the street and wall in troublous times. Then we're going to deal with the 490 years that also begins at the same point in time and ends with the stoning of Stephen in AD 34. We're also going to deal separately with the one week, uh, the 2520 days that Christ confirmed the covenant with many. And in the center of that week, he was crucified. And we're going to deal with the, the entirety of the 2300 year prophecy. But what we're going to do is try to show you that each of these four prophecies that we're referencing are derived from the 2520. They're derived from Leviticus 25 and 26. And then from there we're going to show you that there is also an application of the 49 years, the 490 years, the one week, and the 2300 days. It has an, a present truth end time application at the end of the world. Uh, the point that we're going to attempt to emphasize is that if you reject the 2520, you're rejecting the point of reference for the 2300 year prophecy and also um, shutting down your ability to see how these prophecies illustrate the end of the world. <coughs> and uh, we don't want to shut down any light we have that would help us navigate through the troublous times at the end of the world. So if you turn to page 13 of your notes, we'll begin. The passage that is the point of reference for the rest of the studies today is Great Controversy 409, which is the scripture which above all others has been the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, so we're going to step out of the 2,300 days now and, and look at Leviticus um, 25, verses 8 through 13. And we read that last time. Uh, we read part of that last time in our last presentation. So I'm just going to refer it to you because of time. I, I realize I only have 45 minutes in this presentation. So these verses are dealing with it every seventh year in Leviticus 25, verse 8. They were to let the land rest on, in the seventh year, and they were to repeat this cycle seven times. And then in the 49th year, um, on the Day of Atonement in the 49th year, they were to blow the Jubilee trumpet, and they were also to let the land rest an additional 50th year. Now, if you're familiar with the Jubilee, there is a controversy in Adventism, there's a controversy in the Protestant world, and there's even a controversy in Judaism. And that controversy is, and there's, there's ser several variations of this, that somehow, some way, this 50th year that's the Jubilee is actually the 49th year, uh, that they celebrated the Jubilee year on the first year of the 49th year cycle. So there's, there's it already, since we've been teaching this over the past couple months, I've had Adventists saying, you know, don't you understand that the Jubilee cycle is actually a totality of 49 years? And I say, no, I really don't understand that. I understand the controversy and I'm deriving my understanding from Leviticus 25, which at face value says the 50th year is to be the Jubilee. And from looking at the pioneer testimony, they believed it that way, 49 years, followed by the 50th year being the Jubilee, and you're going to see that Sister White identifies it that way also. So I'm acknowledging that controversy, but I'm not going to deal with it from this point on. I'm suggesting that, let's read it. Leviticus 25, verse 8, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound, and the tenth day of the seventh month, and the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the what? The fiftieth year. So at face value, I'm saying the Jubilee year is the fiftieth year, not the forty-ninth. Okay? And proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which growth of itself in it, neither nor gather the grapes of it, grapes in it of the vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be a holy unto you. 
ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. So you, I know this is hard to see, but this here, this line that I'm showing up here, because I'm going to try to bring some witnesses about this particular mathematical layout. This is what we just read. 49 years, every seventh year in that 49 years, seven times you let the land rest every seventh year. But the 50th year is the Jubilee. Jubilee 50. And, and I'm emphasizing 50 because the number associated with Jubilee is 50. The number associated with Pentecost is 50, and we're going to try to show you that Pentecost is Jubilee in a different sort of way. All right, so what we just went over in Leviticus 25 is this 49-year cycle that's followed by the 50th year Jubilee. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, you're there, all right? Um, I'm going to add a little bit of information to this. I could pass over this, and it would probably be less confusing, but I won't. <laughs> I'm going to try to pull you through this, all right? This seems worth understanding in terms of understanding the, the mentality of the Millerites. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. The year of release. Patriarchs and Prophets, 503. Every seventh year the whole law was to be read in all the assembly of Israel as Moses commanded at the end of every seven years in the solemnity of the year of release. In this 49 years, this, the year that they were to let the land rest is the year of release. So... The Sabbath for the land is also called the year of release. And you would let the, you would let the slaves go free, as an example, what, what release means. Except, of course, if, if I become your slave, and you have a slave woman working for you, and in that, that six-year time period that I'm your slave, if, if me and the, the woman get married, if I love her and I want to stay with her, at the, in the seventh year, I can leave. I don't have to be a slave anymore because it's the year of release. But if I want to stay with that, with that slave girl forever, then I can commit to be, a, I guess, a perpetual slave. That's my word. And you're going to take as my owner, and you're going to put a hole through my ear. And I'm going to be a slave, a permanent slave, almost. But in the 50th year of Jubilee, even the permanent slaves are set free. You follow me? There's a, there's a caveat. The, the slaves are all set free in the year of release, but sometimes the slaves are kept because they want to stay with their spouse, with their family that they've developed. And then they are going to be set free in the Jubilee. And the Jubilee is not the year of release. You'll notice in the next quote, after seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, came the great year of release, the Jubilee. So every seventh year, it was a Sabbath for the land, and it was the year of release... But the 50th year, it's a type of Sabbath too, and it's the great year of release. You follow me? Now, the reason that I want you to see that is because these people that attack the Millerite understanding of the 2520, they, they do it at such a shallow level that they haven't taken the time to see that the Millerites really, they had a, a strong logic for this. If you remember, we've read once in here, twice I think today, that at the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, you were to sound the Jubilee trumpet. Okay, so the Jubilee trumpet is to be sounded on the Day of Atonement. So when the Millerites are looking at this principle that every seventh year is the year of release, but the Jubilee, the fiftieth year, is the great year of release, the Millerites come up with an understanding that they call the Great Jubilee. Okay, it's based upon this principle. Seventh year is your release. Fiftieth year, great year of release. Do you follow me? So they come up with the principle of a great jubilee, and they say that the jubilee cycle is 50 years in entirety, and after 49 of those, comes to 2450. And you read their writings, they're always talking about the 2450. And the 2450, they identify it as beginning the first attack by Nebuchadnezzar in Jerusalem, against Jerusalem, which was 607. And if you go from 607, 2450 years to the future, you come to 1844. Initially, they thought it was 1843. And, and it, isn't on the, it isn't on the chart, so I'm not saying this is a foundational truth. What I'm saying to you is this, that in Leviticus 25, they understood that on the Day of Atonement, 
you were to blow the Jubilee trumpet. And they recognized the Jubilee from Leviticus 25, and they connected it with Daniel 8.14, because they knew that Daniel 8.14 was the Day of Atonement. So their logic, they had these prophecies tied together. These were not separate prophecies. They understood that they were together, because when the Day of Atonement arrived, it was the great Jubilee, and the Jubilee trumpet was to sound. So was there a trumpet that sounded on October 22nd, 1844? Yeah. What trumpet? The seventh trumpet. That's the Jubilee trumpet, is it not? The seventh year is the year of release. The fiftieth year is the great release. Whatever the seventh trumpet is, it's also the Jubilee trumpet, if you accept the Bill Wright logic. Okay. One more thing to throw in there before we really get into our study. All right. Next quote. The Jubilee, the year of restoration. Okay, it says every 50th year, the, the, the Jubilee is the great year of release, but here she's going to call it the year of restoration. Every 50th year, the year of Jubilee, every inheritance in the land was to be restored to its original owner. In the year of Jubilee, you shall return every man into his possession, God declared. Everything's restored. Now, just keep this in mind. This is, this is a big subject, this one here, this restoration, but I'm not going to take time to, to delve into it, but I want to put it in your memory bank if I can. We're going to show you, easily show you, it's not going to be anything that you're, you will think, well, maybe this is true or not, easily show you that Pentecost is the Jubilee. They're interchangeable. The number 50 ties them together, but Ellen White calls them the same thing. We'll show you that in a minute. But Pentecost... As set forth in Acts chapter 2 and 3, according to Peter, Pentecost is the fulfillment of the book of Joel. And in Acts chapter 3, it talks about the times in the plural of restitution of all things. But Acts chapter 3 is based upon Joel. And in Joel chapter 1, there's a series of four insects. The caterpillar, the locust, the palmer worm, the canker worm that do a work of destruction. But in chapter 2, verse 25 of Joel, the promise is, is that I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, and the caterpillar have eaten. Well, Joel's fulfilled in Acts, and Acts is talking about the times of restitution. And the times of restitutions is when the Lord restores the years that these four insects have eaten. But this restoration takes place at Pentecost, and Pentecost is a jubilee, and the jubilee is the time of restoration. So there's a, there's a big theme there that I want you to see. We're not going to go any further with it. All right. Now I probably already put too much information out there to get you to follow along, but please do. What I'm doing here now is I've showed you the line of the jubilee in Leviticus 25. That it's 49 years, and then the 50th year is the Jubilee. You're with me, right? I've given you some extra information, but we're going to meet, move beyond that. Bottom of page 13 in your notes from Signs of the Times, December 1st, 1898. But the time had now come. The Spirit had been waiting for the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. For ten days, the disciples offered their petitions for the outpouring of the Spirit, and Christ in heaven added his intercession. This was the occasion of his ascension and inauguration, a jubilee in heaven. He had ascended on high, leading captives captive, and, and he now claimed the gift of the Spirit that he might pour it out upon his disciples. When did he pour out his Spirit upon his disciples? Because when he poured his Spirit out upon his disciples, there was a jubilee in heaven. When did he do that? Pentecost. Okay, Pentecost is a jubilee. You follow me? And we read in the year of release, which is prefiguring the great year of release. The year of release is every seventh year the land rests. It's prefiguring the 50th year, which is the great year of release, right? And what we read here in our notes is in the year of release and also in the great year of release, what were they to do? They were to read the law. Okay. And what is Pentecost commemorating? When the law is given to Moses. Okay, so these truths are all tied together by various lines of prophecy. Um, I'm on page... Okay, here's where my... 
on page 14. <clears throat> so we're going to look at Pentecost now. We just looked at the Jubilee, and Pentecost follows the Feast of Weeks. This says Feast of Weeks. Okay. Let's read a quote. Fifty days from the offering of the first fruits came the Pentecost, called also the Feast of Harvest and the Feast of Weeks. As an expression of gratitude for the grain prepared as food, two loaves baked with leaven were presented before God. The Pentecost occupied but one day, which was devoted to religious service. So, the Feast of Weeks, it begins when? When did she say it begins? Pardon me? The offering of the first fruits, right here. And then there's 49 days, the Feast of Weeks, and then Pentecost. Do you, do you, without understanding necessarily the connection, you can see that this is a parallel line, right? We've already shown that Pentecost is Jubilee. This is 49 days in the Feast of Weeks. It's paralleling the 49 years and letting the land rest in Leviticus 25. That's followed by the Jubilee. And this is followed by Pentecost. And Pentecost and the Jubilee, same thing, right? Two witnesses. What are they witnessing to, among other things? Year day principle, okay, among other things. Have I lost you? Here's Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 17. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves, two tents of deals, they shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. That's a, the offering of Pentecost. It's fun to study that. Because they're typifying. What are they typifying? They're typifying these two charts. Okay, but we can't go there. But they are. They're based upon the two tables of the Ten Commandments. And they received the two tables on Pentecost. And they were to commemorate that throughout all their generations forever. And when they were commemorating Pentecost, when they received the two tables, they were to bring in two wave loaves, the only offerings in the sanctuary service that contained leaven. And the leaven was to be thoroughly baked. And they were called first fruits, and they were a wave offering. And they're prefiguring the 144,000, which the book of Revelation tells us are first fruits. And the book of Isaiah says the 144,000 are an ensign that's lifted up before the world. Okay, and the two wave loves, therefore, are representing 144,000 who are representing Christ, but they are based upon the two tables of the Ten Commandments, which are representing representation of Christ. And the two tables of the Ten Commandments and the two wave loaves are pointing to these two tables of Habakkuk. And Sister White says these are the rock of ages. This is the foundation, the only foundation that can be laid. This is Jesus Christ, just like the Ten Commandments is Jesus Christ, just like those two wave loaves are as they prefigure the 144,000 who perfectly reflect Jesus Christ. But that's a whole study all by itself. This is the offering at Pentecost, okay? Okay? <laughs> all right, I will try to slow down a tad. <clears throat> what are we doing here? Here's what we're doing. We're showing you the 49-year cycle of the land resting followed by the Jubilee. Now we're giving you a second witness to the Feast of Weeks. 49 days and then Pentecost. We've already given you the quote where Sister White says at Pentecost there was a jubilee in heaven. So you see that connection, correct? Say amen if, you're, if that's good. Okay. Um, in your notes from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, it says a solemn festival of the Jews, Pentecost, so-called because celebrated on the 50th day after the 16th of Nisan. When's, when were they to offer the Passover lamb. 14th. The 14th day of Nisan. Now this is, this is one that's tricky. <laughs> I wish we didn't have a tricky one in here, but we do. Okay, they offer the, the Passover lamb on the 14th of <coughs> Nisan. But this Feast of Weeks takes place on the 16th of Nisan. So how many days is that? 14th, 15th, 16th, how many days is it? It's th is it three? But more often than not, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy is going to refer to two. They're going to say that it was the second day of Passover, the 16th of Nisan. Why is that? 
When were they to offer the Passover lamb? At evening on the 14th. Okay, so you, got, you just need to come to grips with this. You offer the lamb on the 14th, but it's at evening, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the second day is the 16th, but it's actually touched. The whole Passover ceremony is actually touched, touched three days, but it's going to be called the second day. Is this important? Well, for what we're going to try to share, yes. So I'm, I want you to see this, okay? Let me continue in the, um, the first fruit offering from Sister White in the Desire of Ages. Christ arose from the dead on, as the first fruits of those that slept. He was the antitype of the wave sheaf. When was the wave sheaf offered? On the 16th of Nisan, which was the second day of Passover. You with me? And Passover begins on the 14th. And his resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord. For more than a thousand years, this symbolic ceremony had been performed. Dropping to the next quote. Next quote, bottom of the page. The slain of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. So says Paul, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The sheaf of first fruits, which at the time of the Passover was waved before the Lord, was typical of the resurrection of Christ. Paul says, in speaking of the resurrection of the Lord and all the people, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming, like the wave sheep, which was the first ripe grain gathered before the harvest, Christ is the first fruits of that immortal harvest of redeemed ones that at the future resurrection shall be gathered into the garner of God. These types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. On the 14th day of the Jewish month, the very day and month on which for 15 long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified and slain. As the antitype of the wave sheaf, our Lord was raised on the dead, from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of them that slept, a sample of all the resurrected just, whose vile body shall be changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. What's the point? Sometimes Sister White says the second day of Passover. Here she's saying the third. We understand the distinction between second and third, right? Okay. And when he's resurrected, that's the wave sheaf offering, and it begins the Feast of Weeks. And how long does the Feast of Weeks last? 49 days. And then what takes place? The Pentecost. Okay, and the wave sheaf is marking what in Christ's experience? His resurrection. And how do we celebrate his resurrection? Baptism. Baptism, okay. Next quote, Romans 6, 3 through 5. I have a purpose for this, so follow along. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of, a death, of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Was ancient Israel baptized? Yeah. Next quote, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. When did they go through the Red Sea? After Egypt. When did they go through the sea? But that's when they were baptized, right? And baptism represents what? Pardon me? It re yeah, but it represents the resurrection of Christ. When was Christ resurrected? On the 16th of Nisan. When did the Hebrews go through the Red Sea? On the 16th of Nisan. All right, this is, this is Moses. The Passover lamb, I know you can't see this, slain on the 14th. This says 14th. 
The 16th, they're being baptized into the Red Sea. Okay? So what I'm telling you now is that in commemoration from the deliverance of Egypt, and we've read a couple of quotes here. Sister White says, for 1,500 long centuries, this deliverance from Egypt is celebrated in the Feast of Weeks and the Pentecost. And she says it was marked not only as to the event, but as to the time. So if you go back into the history of the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, you'll find that they also are governed by this Feast of Weeks. It's going to be on the 50th day from their baptism in the Red Sea that they received the law. Okay? So I'm giving you a third line. A third line of this 49 leading to 50. And the 50 is the Pentecost of Moses. And it's the Pentecost of the disciples. And there was a jubilee in heaven. So it's the jubilee of Leviticus 25. You follow my logic? Do you? Okay. Because, brothers and sisters, we're going to ultimately show you that this 49 years, it's the same thing. And though know, it's not specifically marked right here, the 50th year is the work of Ezra, and Ezra is going to do all the characteristics that are noted concerning the Jubilee and the Pentecost. And therefore, this 49 years of the 2300 years it's based upon Leviticus 25. That's what we're trying to do here. And I'm building up some witnesses for you to this history so that you can see that this is in human wisdom, that it has several witnesses in God's word. Okay? So in, in your notes, after Moses was baptized in the Red Sea, it says 47th day. It should say 46th day. It's a typo. And where it says the next quote, 49 day, it should say 48. And the next should say 49th. But in Exodus 19.1, it said in the third month, how many days in a month? When did they slay the Passover lamb? <laughs> Come on. They, they slayed the lamb on the 14th of Nisan. And what was Nisan. It was the first month. Okay? So they go through the Red Sea on the 16th of the first month. 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20. 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th. They spent 15 days in the first month, 30 days in the second month, and here in Exodus 19, it says in the third month, this is day 46. In the third month, when the children of Israel gone forth out of the land, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So they're in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day of the third month, which means they're 46 days into this experience. Right? And what happens at this point? Exodus 19, 10 and 11 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. Okay, so on the 46th day, he's saying two days from now, the third day from right now, the, the people need to be sanctified. Why? Because I'm going to come down and speak to him on the 48th day. Amen. All right. And when he comes down and speaks to him, what do they say? What do the people say? <laughs> Moses, you go speak to him. This is too much for us. Okay, so the Lord speaks the law and, and Moses communes with him. And then in Exodus 24, 3 and 4, it says, after, the Lord, after Moses goes and speaks with the Lord, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning. This is now the 49th day. He rose, rises up early in the morning. And built in an altar and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And now he's going to gather the, seven elder, the 70 elders and Aaron and Joshua. And I think Sister White comments on it. And go up to receive the law on the 50th day. Okay. Signs of the Times, August 12, 1880. And Moses went out and told the people all the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took, 
took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. Okay, as he's approaching the reception of the law on the 50th day, he's gathering to get, he's numbering a people. He's taking 70 elders. He's numbering a people. At Pentecost of the disciples, was there a people numbered? Yeah, the 12 disciples. In fact, there was a specific numbering because there was only 11 disciples, right? They have to replace one of the disciples. There's a numbering of the people in the story of the disciples, and there's a numbering of people now because they're coming together as they approach Pentecost, the 50th day. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. These persons were endowed with the Spirit of the Lord in a similar manner as were the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Who's comparing this with Pentecost? Not me. Inspiration. Parallel history. Okay, the disciples are coming together in the upper room, putting away their differences, because on Pentecost, what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. The law is going to be received. Um, next quote from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 3, page 265. After filling the vacancies of the apostolic number, okay, there's a numbering of the people in both of these histories. I want you to see that. Because at the end of this 49 years and the 2300 days, there's a numbering of the people that's going to take place. The numbering of the people takes place at Pentecost. After filling the vacancy in the apostolic number, the disciples gave their time to meditation and prayer, being often in the temple, testifying of Christ and praising God. The Pentecost was a feast celebrated seven weeks after, Pas after the Passover. Upon these occasions, the Jews were required to repair to the temple and present the first fruits of all the harvest thus acknowledging their dependence of the great giver of all good and their obligation to render back to God in gifts and offerings to sustain his cause, that which he had entrusted to them. On this day of divine appointment, the Lord graciously, graciously poured out his spirit on the little company of believers who were the first fruits of the Christian church. Okay, what have I said? Here's what I've said. I've said that in Leviticus 25, the 49-year cycle that is about the land resting, that concludes with the 50th year Jubilee, that this is a parallel to the Feast of Weeks, the 49 days that leads to the 50th day, which is Pentecost. There's a testimony of two. And that this history of the Feast of Weeks is doing nothing more than marking the deliverance of Egypt, out of Egypt, of ancient Israel. And it's, it's the identical numerical it works out perfectly. So in that regard, the Feast of Weeks is commemorating the deliverance from Egypt. So we have three lines. You see my point? We have three lines. So what I'm going to try to show you is that this 49 years is the same prophecy. But in this 49 years where the streets, the street and the walls are going to be built in troublous times, it doesn't specifically say 50, but once the streets and walls are finished, then Ezra is going to accomplish a work that symbolically represents everything about Pentecost and the Jubilee. Therefore, it's there. Okay? Um, and I think I want to do one thing first. And I don't know that I should do this. Now, I'll do this next, if we have time. I don't want to lose you. I want, you to, I want you to get this, and sometimes I go a little bit too far. All right, so let's read Daniel 9.25. Know therefore, it's in your notes. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street and the, shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. That's his history of the 2300 days. Okay. What's the wall represent? You have it in your notes. There's several places where Sister White says this. It's the Ten Commandments. It's God's law. It's the wall. All right. What does this street represent? What's the street that God's people are to walk in in the last days? What's the Ellen White's first vision? It's, it's that path that goes up to heaven. And it has a light behind, which is? the midnight cry, and it has Christ in front that leads us with the light of his glorious right arm. It's the old past. 
the old path is the street that has to be restored at the end of time. And what are the troublous times? Well, the troublous times in Bible prophecy are accomplished by the third wall of Islam. You have that in your notes, Revelation 11, 8. So I'm just, I'm, before I get to really applying it, I'm saying that the work of Nehemiah is prefiguring our work at the end of the world. If you go right before the quote on the wall on page 6, 16, it says from Southern Watchman, April 12, 1904, the experience of Nehemiah is repeated in the history of God's people in this time. So the, the law of God's going to be restored. The old paths are to be restored. And the troublous times is that the world gets brought to its knees by Islam. Amen. Okay? That's how I'm applying this. But go to, go to the book of Nehemiah. This is one of those things that I won't explain closely, but do you know that when, when they built the wall, that the people that participated in building the wall are all named by family? Okay. The Campbells built the wall from the fish gate to the, the dung heap, and the Pippagers built the wall from there to there, and so on and so forth. Nehemiah names these people, right? So there's going to be people involved with building the wall at the end of the world, right? Okay, so in Nehemiah chapter 3, notice verse, let's start in verse 1, so you get what I'm saying if you haven't read this recently. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it. This is verse 1 of Nehemiah 3. And set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachar, the son of Imre. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah, Hassanah, Hassanah build, which also laid beams thereof. So he's describing the complete construction of the wall and the gates, right? And there's only one family. It's not even the entire family. There's a family, and the leaders of this family, the nobles of the family, they refuse to participate in the work. Okay? I want to read who they are. Okay, read verse 5 with me of Nehemiah 3. And next, because this, this is representing a group of people that have been given the responsibility to rebuild the wall, but they're nobles, and they refuse to do it in this family. And their name means trumpet. Their name means trumpet. In verse 5 it says, And next unto them the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. The Tekoites refused to do the work of the Lord in rebuilding the wall. The nobles of the Tekoites. So there's some of us that have been called to give the trumpet a certain sound. But evidently, because we consider ourselves nobles, we're not going to do the work of the Lord. Anyway. We're dealing with Nehemiah here. That's in the record. Go to Nehemiah 7 1. I'll try to start pulling this together. Nehemiah 7 1. Now it came to pass when the wall was built. When was the wall going to be built? In troublous times. That's the circumstances, but when? In 49 years. So when the wall is built, what has taken place? 49 years of history, has it not? The prophecy says it's going to be built in 49 years, right? So in Nehemiah 7, 1, the wall has been built, so what has just passed? 49. Does God's word ever fail? When Moses came out of Egypt, did he come out roughly at the time prophesied by Abram? The self-same day God's word never fell. In Nehemiah 7.1, if, if the work's been done, the 49 years is accomplished. Right? Okay. Now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I'd set up the doors, and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Han Hanani, and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man, and he feared God above many. And I, I won't read it all, but I'll just point you down to verse 
7, what happens in verse 7 after the wall's built? It says, Then came Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, Bigvai, Nehem, Bena. The number, I say, of this man and of the people of Israel was this. What's he going to do? He's going to number the people. The children of Perosh, 2,172. The children of Shephatiah, three. When, do, when does the people get numbered? At Pentecost. At Pentecost. The disciples are numbered. The 70 elders are numbered. At Pentecost, there's a numbering of people. What's the number that represents Pentecost? In this prophecy, right here in the 50th year, there's a numbering of the people that takes place. You follow me? Amen. Go to Acts, or, or is that Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 3. And you tell me what this first thought is representing. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. What's this? It's unity. They're coming into unity. This is a symbol of them coming into unity at Pentecost, right? And all the people gathered together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of what? The law of Moses. They're going to read the law. When did they read the law? Well, they read the law in the year of release and the great year of release in this history. In the Jubilee, they were to read the law. But what's Pentecost a symbol of? The receiving of the law. So in this history, after the 49 years, after the work is done, there's a numbering of the people. There's a reading of the law. This is the characteristics of Pentecost and Jubilee. Do you see it? Verses, okay, and it's, it emphasizes that. Go to uh, chapter 9 of Nehemiah. I want to show you something else that takes place there Amen. in the 50th year. This is in the 50th year, right? The wall's built in the 40th, nine year, it's completed. So in the 50th year, in, in chapter 9, verse 38, it says, And because of all this, we made a sure covenant. Did the Lord enter into covenant with ancient Israel on Mount Sinai? Did he enter into covenant with the Christian church at Pentecost? Yes. Okay. So they're making a covenant here, paralleling Pentecost, but that's not all. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Now those that were sealed, that sealed were, and it lists out Numbered. the sealing process of those that are sealed. It lists out those that are sealed at this point in time. There's a sealing that is taking place here in the 50th year. And what does Pentecost in your notes? Great Controversy 611. What does Pentecost point forward to? Two, two histories. Let's read it from Great Controversy 611. And then the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. What angel is that? That's the angel of Revelation 18, is it not? A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. So she's comparing the Millerite history with the latter rain history of our day and age. And in the next paragraph, she says... The work will be similar to the day of Pentecost. Is there a sealing that takes place in Revelation 18? Was there a sealing typified in the Millerite history? Absolutely. Was there a sealing at Pentecost? Absolutely. Was there a sealing in the 50th year of the 2300 year prophecy? According to Nehemiah, absolutely. And the sealing took place when the law was being read and they were entering into covenant. And there was a numbering of the people. What I want you to see, if you're willing to see, is this 49 years of building the streets and walls in troublous times? This is based upon Leviticus 25 and the Jubilee. Because Leviticus comes before Daniel, does it not? Do you see that? Can I take you just a couple steps further? Now, if you see that, that's what you needed to see. The, the, X, the, the next is just kind of some fluff. All right. Did they build the streets and walls? Did they go to work on 457 and just trudge along 
and build the streets and wall, and it took him 49 years? Is that what happened? How long did it take him to actually do the work? Very short work. Very short work. So the work they did was right at the end, right? They didn't do anything for the first 49 years, really, except go build their own houses. And they're out of Babylon now. They're going to they're gonna experience the condition that we know as Laodicea. They're not going to do the work. But how long did it take them to do the work? Go to Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 15. Chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. It took him 52 days to do the work. 52 days to do the work. Okay, keep that in mind. I want to show you something. Here's, here's where we're going to go just a step beyond. So, all right, just, we'll go slow. How many of you are familiar with the study of the pattern of Christ? This study, the opponents of this message, they don't touch this one. I have challenged the opponents of this message for at least 10 years, more than 10 years now, since the 1990s, to go ahead and show why this is erroneous. Because this particular study, it proves the pioneer position that the daily represents paganism in a totally different way than they're willing to address. Okay, there's a pattern of Christ in Bible prophecy, not dealing with his nature, but up on his time on earth. There are several lines to this pattern of Christ. You can go to Revelation 11 and establish this pattern. I'm not going to do so. I'm simply going to remind you of the pattern of Christ because this is an established truth. But I will show you the pattern of Christ. I don't know when Christ was born, whether it's 3 B.C. or 2 B.C. That's what this number 3 is here. All right. I'm open for correction. This is when Christ is born. But the Bible and the spirit of prophecy both teach that he was 30 years old when he was baptized. Okay? And when he's baptized, he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week, for 2,520 days. First, with his personal witness for 1,260 days, and then for 1,260 days in the person of his disciples. So what I want you to see about the pattern of Christ, I'm just taking a snippet of it, is that he's born, and then he has 30 years of preparation before he's empowered at his baptism. And he gives his testimony for 1260 days, and then he's crucified. Everyone see that? Okay. But there are other lines of prophecy that are governed by this line, as is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, the Pope of Rome, the papacy, is governed by this line. And it has 30 years of preparation from the year 508 until 538. And in 538, it's empowered, just as Christ was empowered, and it gives its satanic testimony, not for 1260 days, but for 1260 years. And at the end of the 1260 years, it receives its deadly wound paralleling Christ's crucifixion. You see that? That's the pattern of Christ. And there's, there's many other things to derive from this. But if you don't understand that paganism was removed in 508 and identifies 30 years of preparation for the papacy to take the throne of the earth, then you're missing a really important point of Bible prophecy. So when you take the wrong position of the daily, you turn off all kinds of lights. But that's not what I'm dealing with. What I'm dealing with is this. How many have looked at this study before? Raise your hand. Okay, so many of us have. So I want to show you something you may not have looked at before. Are you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> when was Christ crucified? In the midst of the week. The of the week is the correct answer, but keep going. When was he crucified? 31. One more step. On the 14th. And he rested in the grave on the 15th. Right? And he was resurrected on the 16th. Correct? And then begins the Feast of Weeks. Correct? Correct? Everyone with me? All right. When was the papacy crucified, so to speak? 
1798. One year later is 1799. One year later is 1800. If we go 49 years into the future, we come to 1849. And in 1850, the Lord gives us the 1850 chart because he's entering into covenant with us. Do you see that? Amen. See this chart here? This doesn't come in 1849 or 1851. This is the 1850 chart. Brothers and sisters, this chart here doesn't mark when the Lord enters into covenant with us because in 1843, 1842, when this chart's printed, are the Millerites keeping the law of God? Is he going to enter into covenant with people that aren't keeping the law of God? When did James and Ellen White keep, start keeping the Sabbath? 1846. This is marking when the covenant takes place because the law of God is enshrined right here. But the Antichrist is paralleling the life of Christ and he brings you right to 1850 huh. if you understand the year day principle Amen. of Bible prophecy. So, in this history, how many years are there? Well, there's 50 from here to here, right? But we started it back in 1798. Which is how many? The 52, the 52 days of Nehemiah. Four fifty-seven. Go back to the fourteenth of Nisan, which is four fifty-nine, and come out here forty-nine years to four o eight, and then in four o seven, you have the jubilee. You have Pentecost, based upon Nehemiah 6.5. The work took 52 days, a day for a year. Is that too much information? Okay, so what I want to share with you here in closing, we're closing now. We almost did this in the right amount of time. I'm only three minutes over. Okay. Are you with me? What I, th what I have done, I believe, and I hope you understand, is I've given you several witnesses, and I've even taken it to Millerite history and back into Nehemiah, which I didn't need to do. I gave you the witness of the Leviticus 25, of the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Weeks is commemorating the history of Moses, so we gave you the history of Moses in order to show you that the 49 years, the first prophecy of the 2300 years, is based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. If you throw out the year-day principle and Leviticus 25 and 26 in the year-day principle in connection with Leviticus 25 and 26 and the Millerite understanding of the 2520, then you're throwing out the biblical point of reference for the first portion of the 2300-year prophecy and you're destroying it. Okay, that's what I want you to see and I added some extra things on there because they're there. But, but what I want you to see along with that is that I know people don't want it erased what I want you to see is that the third decree in 457 is typifying 1844 when the third angel's message arrives because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning and the beginning of the 2300 year prophecy is on the third decree Prefigure the third message that arrives in 1844. So 457 is prefiguring 1844. 457 is when the third decree arrives. 1844 is when the third message arrives. Are you with me? And what I'm suggesting to you here, now this is human reasoning. This is the one you'll have to test. Because I'm going to make some applications about these four prophecies, and I might be wrong. I don't have a thus saith the Lord for what I'm going to suggest. I'm suggesting that this 49 years is representing the work of God's people. You've got to rebuild the street, the walls, in troublous times. 
Okay, in, in the next presentation, I'm going to suggest that the 490 years is talking about the probationary time given to God's people. So in each of these, these prophecies that we're going to look at, I'm going to assign what I understand about them. I could be wrong, but I'm saying that the 49 years represents the work that God's people are to do. And therefore, in 1844, symbolically, time is no longer after 1844, symbolically, this 49 years is talking about the work that Adventism is to accomplish. Rebuild the street, the walls, and troublous times. But Adventism, it put off the work, went into a Laodicean condition right out of the, the starting gate. But they're going to do the work. The Lord's going to finish the work, brothers and sisters. Amen. It's going to be right at the end. It's going to be in 52 days. It's going to be in that little period of time right at the end, in troublous times. That 52, 52 days begins when the troublous times arrive. Okay. 9-11. Troublous times are back in history. And it concludes at Pentecost, the Sunday law. Is it okay to line the Sunday law up with Pentecost? Oh, yeah, it sure is. So what I'm saying is that this history here, from 1844 to the Sunday law, is typified by the 49 years of the 2300 years. And it's teaching us that at the very end of Advent history, there's going to be a work accomplished that begins when the troublous times arrive, 9-11, and is finished with the numbering of the people and the sealing of the 144,000. And if you throw out the pioneer understanding of Leviticus 25 and 26, you won't see this. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we're living in a time when every vision is to be accomplished. We thank you for allowing us to see just a small portion of, of the light that you're opening up to your people at this time. We thank you that we're seeing enough of this light that we're allowing ourselves to be brought into a time of testing, a time of, of trouble uh, with Brothers and sisters, that is preparing us for a greater crisis just ahead. We know that we don't deserve to be in this number that's being called to this work. But we also know that you've promised that you're willing to finish in each of us the work that you've began if we would but participate. So we ask that you would finish that work in each of us. We pray for the group of Adventists that have not been confronted with these truths at this time and ask that when you finally open the door for them to make a decision about considering these things, that you would grant them the grace to take the time to personally investigate these things through prayer, through their own study, and that you'd guide them into all truth according to your will. And we pray also earnestly for those that are already decidedly fighting this message and ask that you would allow the, the life of Saul to be reenacted in their life, that they might be turned around and become a Paul. We thank you for allowing us to come together this Sabbath, last night, throughout this day, and study these things. We understand that not only are the troublous times taking place within your church, but what's going on outside your church is also indicating your soon return. We give permission to your Holy Spirit to use these, these realities to bring conviction upon us that we might consecrate us ourselves to the work of preparing a character that in the near future can be lifted up before the world as an ensign to finish the work that we might go home with you soon. We thank you for calling us. We ask that you'd finish the work. In Jesus' name, amen.